Hi guys, everyone. Um, this video is gonna be about my car um, actually experience. As um, I have just recorded my my video on my doctor appointment. Yeah, that's why I decided to separate the two because I mean they are on two different issues. If you're interested in what uh what a law student do and probably you will be interested in this and yes I have changed because um, that was my home clothes and I don't feel very unlike the old videos whereby I would just wear pajamas and record I don't feel very comfortable in that but um, sorry for my boniness that's why I say I'm losing weight and and it's okay just one thing it's not fun to have eating disorder at all and it really compromises your study. It really does. It aff affects me so much. I used to be the top student and now I'm not anymore. And yeah, basically. So anyway, um, so my school work in this system. We have each student is assigned to two mentors. One is an internal mentor who is a school lecturer uh, inside the faculty. And uh, another one is an external mentor. Mine, it's, I mean, I am a very lucky student, I can say. Because my external mentor, it's not just a lawyer working in a firm. My mentor used to be, okay, he is a lawyer. He was a lawyer. Well, he is, no, actually, he was, yeah. He was a lawyer. Um, he is not a lawyer anymore. Um, he was working at the Department of Justice, the director, which is the head. So I, uh, back then, at during year one, I got like one week of intern, uh, we're not paid for it, uh, intern inside and then we get to follow lawyers around and look at different things, uh, interact with different people, talk to different people and learn about things. And it was just really cool compared to like having a mentor who is a lawyer in a firm because all you do, you can just apply to the firm and you work under that lawyer researching for his file and stuff um, so now my mentor he resigned I mean not he resigned his contract with the Department of Justice is up so he is now um, working in in the court of first instance yeah as a judge he's a judge right now so that's how I got this court marshalling uh, thing going on which it, uh, because I can just email him and apply for this thing and he would just um, he is a very very nice guy he is a very nice guy so first of all I'm gonna talk about uh, the advantages of okay this sounds so formal uh, well this court martial experience I was thinking either to do it for one week or two weeks but uh, he offered two weeks so I just take the two weeks um, and then so what I do is I go to the court, I, okay, that is one of the advantages. If you are court martial, which is, uh, where martial means like, sort of like you follow the judge and you sit in to listen to cases. Um, you don't get to talk in the court, but you listen to them and then you observe it. Uh, so what you do is I get a pass. Yeah, I get a, I have a pass that... Uh, uh, allowed me to assess it as like authorized personnel uh, so you get behind the scene that kind of thing and then you see what happened behind the scene other than I mean the court is always opened you can always walk into cases and you listen to the cases but you don't get the behind door assess so that's how the that's one advantage of it and Hong Kong, it's a common law system, so we use precedent. Precedent means former cases. So uh, you get to, uh, so during the case, he would need the precedents to support his judgment. So what we do is that we sometimes we help out with his uh, checking information, reconfirming it, and then sometimes we do, um, we search on relevant information that he require us to do. Um, and then second advantage is that you get to talk to the judge if you're a court martial. 
you don't get to talk to the lawyer that is the disadvantages because um, you don't know what's going on for their sides but you get to go to the judge chamber they call it the chamber which is his office uh, it's behind the I mean if you have been to a court you realize that the court, judge come out from a door that is next to his chair that is his chamber uh, he has an office and his class there so that is his chamber you get to go inside you get to talk to the judge you get to see his views because he is I mean being a judge he's a very experienced lawyer so that's what it is and um, third advantage is that you get to observe the case uh, depending on what kind of case my uh, my my judge he is uh, he's a foreigner um, so but he's living in Hong Kong right now so it's pretty it's pretty fun you know he my school mentor actually says that he has very interesting cases uh, which is handed down to him so this recent one was on drug trafficking and I'm gonna talk on that later and then oh yeah uh you get to because the court of first instance is like this whole building of courts so basically one judge is uh standby i mean not standby uh the judge is in a court whatever court you go into you will always see the same judge they don't travel around so that's how it happens so if you are free so if we are free we, a court session occurs at two time. One is 10.30 in the morning for two hours until 12.30 and the next one is 2.30 until 4.30 but the working hours is from 9 to five, nine to 6 and to 5 on Friday. So then what happens is that if we so happen to have the free time, we can go to another court to listen to cases which is very interesting because you get to look at different cases and right now there are a lot of drug trafficking cases and three rape cases going on so basically what happened was that um, I was released one uh, an hour earlier to uh, an hour earlier for lunch that day and then the court next to ours uh, was one on drug trafficking which I was not interested because I I'm already listening to one in drug trafficking and then the next court uh, there are three courts on one level and then the next court is on rape and this rape case is very very uh, famous like not famous popular no not popular notorious I don't know the word for it but it's pretty on is on the news because it's this foreign foreign guy who get uh, who is accused of rape uh, by three women he raped three women and he is on trial right now so it's very interesting when I when I went to the court and then I look at the different lawyers doing things with different uh, doing things to the judges and to the judge and you can see the competence the competence of like one lawyer as compared to the other you see the experience some of them are like um, I don't know what I am doing or like you have some of them who are very confident they just speak in court and then you know um, for this court of first okay this is gonna be complicated because I have to explain the court system um, the court of first instance uh, they trial cases that are more serious and they are the first time that is raised in court in court yeah the first time the trial occurs in court is first raised in a district court and then the trial begins in the first court first instance so after the verdict you can go to the court of appeal because you don't agree with the judgment and then there is the court of final appeal um, it's some sort of similar to like the UK uh, the UK system because it's handed down from the UK um, in UK they call it the Queen's Bench or something. I forgot what it's called. Um, so basically, I was saying that I get the I get the behind the scene, the kind of pass, which is this one. You can't see it. It's a marshals, judiciary marshals. Um, it's this pass that I have it with me, and I get to assess to. I need this card to like tap onto the doors to assess 
to the left behind and uh, whereby you get to the office of the judges and the clubs and the different places behind the courts as compared to the public whereby you take the lift and then you go inside the court you sit on the bench that's all you do but we get a behind door access so aside from the advantages i'm going to talk about the disadvantages okay because of this case this particular case that i was listening to it started last last week before my uh, marshalling began so i don't know what happened before that by the time i get to by the time my first day of marshalling uh the jury is supposed to reach their verdict uh whether the person is guilty or not so basically uh they took a really long time um there are three other students with me um not with me they are sitting in with me also fallen also uh as a student marshal and the thing is like it's really depressing when the person on the trial is not a rapist is not a murderer but he get terrible sentence as a jury um you know you the thing about jury is that you don't have connection with the outside world once you are a jury jury it's uh are for for drug trafficking we have a panel of seven juries so what they do is that they gather together they watch the the, the video the evidence they listen to the the, the cases and I mean they li listen to the different people talking and then they make their verdict based on the evidence and the judge will give direction to them as to what they should pay attention to and what they should uh, decide whether the man is guilty or not guilty so this uh, this particular person is a taxi driver with a primary three level of education and he was on that from his gambling habits so what happened was that he was I he used to be a drug addict but he was he is no longer one for 10 years so uh, basically he was lured into this crime because he is on that and there's another taxi driver who offered him that why don't you smuggle some iPhone for me and for every iPhone that you smuggle, I pay you four hundred dollars for your uh, in in return to pay for your debt. So he agreed to it. I mean, he can suspect that something is wrong because the case things always take always takes place so secretively. He would know that something is wrong, but he did not touch the evidence. He did not touch whatever that was caught on him, and. It was very depressing because he was caught drug trafficking for Hong Kong it's like once uh, it's higher than 600 grams of illegal drugs it's already considered a lot of drug so that is a maximum that will be a sentence a jail sentence of 21 years or higher based on the, the, the factors in the case so the jury will not know what it's the judge what we, what is the sentence that is the horrible part so basically they decide the verdict they they chop they say that the man is guilty but they don't know what is what will the sentence be so it's very depressing in the sense that you see this man who is sort of like innocent he didn't kill anybody he just wanted to pay off his debt he doesn't know his legal knowledge doesn't know anything about it and and it, it's, it's it's very difficult to come to the fact that he is now guilty he's gonna lose like he is 70 70 plus no he is 50 plus years old he's gonna spend his next 20 plus years in the jail by the time we come out he's gonna be an old man that's not like gonna be the end of his life it that's that's a, that's a depressing part and it's really hard to take into take to accept the fact of it and the second disadvantage is that um, there will be times when it's closed court so what happened was that um, when they delivered the verdict it was already after six o'clock I went home um, the judge said they are probably not going to deliberate today but they end up did 
because they want to go home. Obviously, they want to go home because the trial had been going on for one week. So they want to go home. They, they, uh, it was six to one. So basically, six person says that he's guilty, and it's best to it's best to achieve a unanimous uh, verdict. But sometimes it's imp impossible. So uh, six to one is okay. Um, so they all went home, and the sentencing is supposed to occur the next day. So the next day, when I go back, um, the judge wanted to uh, reduce his sentence because he thinks that he's too much. And the iPhone cases, the iPhone that he's supposed to smuggle, are like iPhone that you would buy from like a shop. It's plastic wrapped, sealed, and uh, they don't find any of his fingerprints on the box itself. So that is the difficult part, um, and you know you wouldn't, unless I mean he would have suspected something, but you wouldn't know that if somebody if you go to a shop and buy the phone like in that in that in that shop uh, in that case itself, you wouldn't suspect there will be drug inside. So that's the problem, and so um, what happened is that. Uh, the judge wanted to know his role in the, uh, he, the role that he played in this crime, so that it can be some sort of mitigating factors that can reduce his sentence to less than twenty one years. Uh, so then, uh, the court took a break of like one hour. The lawyer talked to him, and we came back to court. And what happened is that he wanted to reveal more evidence, probably pointing towards the man. Uh, behind this sort of crimes and so uh, the they're gonna order and they're gonna arrange for a trial in six weeks and the lawyer said that it's gonna be closed court so even though I'm no longer a student marshal I want to listen to what is the final sentence I cannot go in because it's a closed court closed court means that nobody can go in except for the lawyers and the judge involved and the jury cannot go back to once they deliver their verdicts so um okay th that is the third disadvantages of like uh, being a court martial is that you can't communicate with the lawyers involved even the prosecution lawyers who are working at the uh, department of justice so uh, i mean the, the judge is working as a judge for the department of justice you have the prosecutor who is a lawyer under the department of justice and then you have the legal aid, who is also under the Department of Justice, but they are working for different people. They are like they're working against each other, so you cannot communicate with them. You don't know what is happening to them. Neither can you communicate with the criminal, um, the suspect, the defendant. They call it a defendant. Um, so basically, that's all the disadvantages and advantages. I'm sorry that this is taking so long, and I'm really really long in that end. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about. Um, the problems that is within this system which I hate so much and that is some problem that I find with uh, according to my personal experience uh, which I find very difficult to talk about earlier in my videos in my past videos which I explained that I was like really depressed because uh, I was having some issues with the police so it's that I this personal experience with the police is that I know the police know how to play the games. They can fabricate information. And the per no normal people without Nico knowledge will not suspect anything. They will not know that Nico, they will not have the legal knowledge to know their rights and stuff. So that is the problem. They make up things and because of their authority, the police authority, that they are the authority, people believe them, the jury will believe them unless you have this personal experience like mine who experience them fabricating stuff like I went, like I talked to the police and said I did not say that and he said um okay uh, we can't change it on the paper you can add another sentence and sign it there but but if I sign it does it mean that I'm like agreeing to what you have said in front that would be like me arguing my own case and changing my own words. So I know that they can fabricate stuff and I hate that part. And the second part is that 
when you are arrested, they have the police custody form, which means you're under police custody and you have to sign the form. On the form, they have a list of like your rights and stuff. They sort of explain it to you. There is a part that you can get a call, you can call your relatives, you can call your parents, you can call your family members. You can also call your lawyers or we can provide you with a list of like uh, our lawyers, society or something. But there is no mentioning of legal aid that you can get. So that is the most horrible part because people will not know that they can get legal aid. They can get a lawyer for free if they don't have money to pay for it because for this particular case, this man said that I don't want a lawyer because I don't have money to hire one. And when, when um, the other student asked the judge about this, they said that the police is not under any obligation to explain to the defendant that he has the right to get a legal aid lawyer. So that went against his case, of course. So and then um, the third point is that the mitigating factor, age does not play a part in the mitigating factor. It does not reduce the sentence. Even though you can be 80 years old and then you are sentenced to life imprisonment or you are sentenced to 10 years in prison, you will be end up totally dead in the prison, but nobody's gonna care. Like that is the sentence. If you want it to be changed, you go to another place for it. That's not the court uh, rules to do it. So it, age is not a mitigating factor. And third, the fourth point is that there is no duty lawyer at the police station. That is the, that sucks because, you know, a normal person arrested, you cannot wait for, like, um, a normal person arrested cannot wait for, like, a lawyer. I mean, like, okay, unless you are this super rich man who has a personal lawyer you can call on any time, 24-7, normal people wouldn't have it you know how much it costs to have a lawyer and that's just terrible because there's no duty lawyer at the police station you get interrogated immediately um, for minor crimes um, because this particular case it was all recorded uh, on tape so it kind of helped a bit but for mine there were no cameras there were just People talking to me and the worst thing was that everything was happening in Cantonese and everything was written in Chinese and my Chinese and my Cantonese sucks that went against my case if I were to really go to court but uh, for my case they actually dropped the case they let me off at, with a warning but it went against my, I mean it, it was it was really really unfair to me unfair to people who are born in Chinese but Chinese is not their first language so I can't wait for like a translator to come over to explain everything to me and while I can actually understand Cantonese a little bit and I can read Chinese a little bit and you know when I actually told the police that I didn't say the sentence they say I, what do I want to explain and I told them what I want to explain and they were like um, so I will write out the sentence and you can just copy it down um, and I asked do you have to write in traditional Chinese because Hong Kong use traditional Chinese and they said uh, yeah it's better if you write it in traditional Chinese we uh, it's, it's not that good because I learned I, I learned simplified Chinese and it's much easier for me to write that and also when I mentioned that I don't really no uh, Cantonese or like proper traditional Chinese and the CIA um, no the CID the CID I don't know what CID I don't know what it stands for but it's like a high authority the people who investigate the case um, they were like oh so you come from mainland China I was like no off you know like that of course I didn't say that but then I was like is that prejudice? Are you racist or something? Does it mean that I don't understand Chinese? Or I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't speak can, I don't speak Cantonese, or I don't understand traditional Chinese means that I come from mainland China. That's just like so wrong, and I hate the police. Um, 
Hong Kong has just been crazy with this like China coming over and then um, the changing of the systems. There were this umbrella movement in Hong Kong. Um, if any of you have paid attention internationally, it was so, so, um, it was, it went viral internationally uh, because the Hong Kong police were just acting terribly to the no local citizens. So ever since that incident, I hated Hong Kong police. And now with this particular personal experience with it, it just make it worse. Okay. And okay, so I'm going to go back to this court martialing experience. Yes, it's a very interesting experience because I get to see the behind the scene things going on all that. But it's also very depressing. And, you know, sometimes people who do things not because of their own own personal choice like you see this man he want to pay off his debt he is um singled with a daughter who left him with a girlfriend so-called a girlfriend uh on financial assistance and i mean who doesn't want to be a happy carefree person who wants to do crimes who want to risk their life who want to risk their money who wants to risk everything you know the Rawls theory. If you study uh, jurisprudence and ethics, I think it's Rawls. Rawls theory. He say like, he suggested that men are uh, risk averse and self interested. So, why would anyone want to do that? Just just the same as mental illness. Like, why? Who would choose to be sick? Who wants to be depressed all the time? Who wants to cut themselves? Who wants to cry every day? Who wants to be, who feel lonely and like sad all the time? Nobody. Who doesn't want to be happy? Everybody wants to be happy. And this is the sad fact of life that, you know, I can't change. And it's almost impossible to change. It's like something that is so deeply rooted in the society that, that the world is this way and it's going to stay this way. That is the very depressing part and I think that, you know, people like like me particularly, I tend to overthink things and I would rather that I'm mentally retarded than to be smart and thinking because if you just don't think so much, you'll be much happier, I think. So um, I don't have happy story to share, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for watching this long video. If you're interested, uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Also, um, I I don't mind any questions. You know, just you can you can leave comment down below any questions on law or on like if you have watched my other videos. You have any question? Just uh, comment below. If I have enough questions, I can actually do a videos on like Q and A itself so thank you for watching and subscribe to my channel if you're interested so thank you see you